This presentation covers crop selection and management when in a drought. Near the end, it presents a strategy for irrigating alfalfa during a low water year. Jay Davison is the Alternative Crops and Forage Specialist with University of Nevada Cooperative Extension. All right, as you just heard from Chris, Nevada has some real uh, climate, what I call climate realities. It's the driest state in the nation. There's no doubt about that, number one. Number two, most of our precipitation occurs during the winter months. It doesn't occur during the growing season, so from a plant standpoint, our, our water that we get isn't very effective. If, if we get a real good winter, we get a little bit of soil moisture, but the fact of the matter is we don't get much when it's growing. And it looks like it's drying and warming in western Nevada. Uh, when I first came here in 98, I pulled the date over 40, 50 years and looked at growing degree days. It's, it's a measurement of heat units over 50 degrees. And we were about 2,760. In the last 12 years, looking at it, 12, 15 years, we're over 3,000. So there's definitely been a little bit of warming. I mean, uh, whether, how it's, why, I have no idea, but certainly it looks like it's uh, warming. And with the drought that we're here, uh, bottom line is it is. It's getting a little more dry. And drought in that Nevada's normal. I mean, it, it, that's the way it is. And so we ought, we ought to be planning and thinking about it uh, the whole time that we're, when we're dealing with it. This shows you precipitation in uh, Lahontan Valley, uh, 93 through 2013, 4.12 inches average. But look how many years are below average. The reason it's even high is 4.12 because we've had some of these real good years that push everything high. But just the point that Sherman was making, most years will get less than that. So what can we do about it? What, what are some of the things that we can do when we get into these drought situations? Well, we can fallow some cropland, and we're actually looking hard at that in some of the Diamond Valley area. Uh, their water table's dropping two feet a year. The uh, water master, I'm a water master, the state water engineer has told them flat out, if you don't come up with a plan to meet this, we're gonna, I'm gonna have to designate this as a critical basin, and we're gonna start shutting wells down. Simple as that. And so, uh, without a doubt, there's going to be some of these areas that are, uh, are going to look at fallowing. Obviously, we can increase the efficiency of our irrigation systems is what we can do. We'll work on that. We can produce crops that use less water and look at deficit irrigation. Now, I'm going to go all over these and, and finally, like the, the boys in Lovelock, go on vacation. <laughs> you know, no irrigation last year, one the year before that. What else are you going to do? I mean, you've you got to have water to grow crops in Nevada. So what about following cropland? How do you go about it? I mean, what, what are some of the steps? One of the things you want to do is look at your production records. Which fields are your most productive? Those are your most valuable fields, right? And hopefully you've got production records by fields. But that's the first thing. Then come along February or March, we're going to have at least some estimate of how much water we're going to have and maybe how long it'll be there, right? So we can estimate our irrigation water amounts and the duration. And then you, you can look at your fields and look at your crop water demand, which we'll talk about in a second, looking at the ET uh, values and get an idea, all right, I'm, I'm going to need this much water for this many, these type of crops. And then once you've put that data together, look at allocating the water to your most productive ground. I mean, it's, it's, these are hard, going to be hard scenarios, but the fact of the matter is, we're, this, is a, this is a tough situation right now. I mean, it's uh, th third year. I've been doing this 35 years. It's the worst I've seen. In, in that time period. So let's look at some of the efficiencies of irrigation systems. What we use around here, graded border. Actually, you know, you hear everybody bad mouth and flood irrigation, but the irrig and this is on farm efficiencies. This isn't worrying about the distributions and your losses and things like that. But on farm, your uh, attainable is around 80 percent. Average probably somewhere around 65 percent. But there's some things that a guy can do to, to improve that. Real line's really not that much better, uh, a little bit better on, on the average, but not that much better than a graded border. Center pivots, uh, these range from the old impact heads, which I still see out there in Diamond Valley, believe it or not. What's an impact head? Jay? It's like, it's like a, a rainbird head clear up on top, okay. high pressure. Okay. Right, right, right. And, you know, they're up around 80%. Uh, and w then we can go all the way down to these lipas, which is... Uh, Real low pressure dropping. It's it stands for low energy precision application. I'll show you a picture of it. Yes, Margo. What is graded border? It, it's what that is. It just, that's just our flood 
Uh, that's, flood that's our flood irrigation, yeah, which just borders on both sides and, and we flood down the middle. And then uh, micro irrigation or, or drip. And you know, around here we've never really thought much about subsurface drip on forage crops. But the fact of the matter is, uh, I did work on this 25 years ago and it, it, it's extremely effective. It works very well on, on uh, alfalfa. And we'll talk about, uh, I'll talk about that a little more. And we're seeing this in California going on big time. They're putting more and more uh, subsurface drip on perennial crops because their water over there makes us look still good. So what are the primary inefficiencies on that border irrigation? Deep percolation and surface runoff. When I first came here, we had a lot of surface runoff. I don't see that anymore. We don't see uh, people going to the end of the fields at all <laughs> in, in a, lot of the, a lot of the times. And, and we look at it, and this is, this is the problem. Wide borders, long runs, it takes a long time to get across it because you don't have a big enough head. And so what happens is, on this upper end of your field, you get deep percolation, right? You're losing a lot of water. And, and this is doing two things. Not only is it wasting water, but you're losing nutrients because you're going to push your things like nitrogen down. But you're also excluding oxygen from the soil. And when you do that, plant stops growing. So your yields are affected on, on this end. Then we get down here, especially like what we're looking at now, where we don't get enough water to the tail. What happens is we get into stressed, uh, water stress. And we'll talk about that a little, a little bit more. And this is real common. So what can we do about it? One of the things is we can reduce the length of the runs. Uh, these things have got bigger over, my, my experience is I've seen borders wider, runs longer, and we, if we really don't increase your head, you get into that problem I just saw. So one of the things that I expect that we'll see in the future if the water levels stay is we're gonna see shorter runs, narrower borders. So we can get that water across there faster. Now, the other thing that obviously you could do is install a tailwater return or reuse system. We don't see much of that around here because we really don't have that much tailwater, it seems like, anymore. And what, again, 25 more years ago, we were doing work with surge irrigation. And surge irrigation, what we do is we put water across it, shut it off, open another border, put water across that, and once that starts to soak in or have soaked in a little bit, come back on and surge it again. And what that does is it cre increases the speed that you get across your, water, your, across your ground. And so with the surge irrigation, you see efficiency gains of 28 to 35 percent in the research. This can be manual or it can be uh, automatic. And in fact, we have a grant application in right now where we're looking at uh, putting on uh, mechanical openers and with sensors and everything else uh, to utilize surge irrigation. All right, how about a sprinkler system? We don't use a lot of that around here, but in western Nevada, they're not all that uncommon. What's the first thing? Fix the leaks. Even today, I go around and I see these pivots and I see these wheel lines shooting water every which way. Doesn't do much for your distribution or water efficiency. It, it's basically wasted. The other thing you can do, and it's easy to do, is check your distribution with catch cans. Long, and you can use anything as long as they're the same size and they're straight sided. You put them down alongside your sprinkler systems, run it for an X amount of time, two hours, three hours, four hours, whatever, and then go and measure the water depth it should be if, if your sprinkler system's working right and you've got good distribution, it ought to be pretty even across there. If you're much 10, 15% difference, you know you've got to start checking something. Uh, and it also gives you your precipitation rate. That's important because I'll talk about ET and soil moisture uh, when we're talking about scheduling irrigation because that's, that's something anybody can do. Replace worn nozzles. Water is erosive. You don't think of it like that, but it is. And these, I've seen some of these uh, pivots with nozzle packages that are 15 years old. Never change the nozzle. It's real problematic if you're trying to put a nice even distribution and uh, even application. Look at these low pressure. Most, most of the pivots have gone to some of these low pressures, but these LEPA systems are relatively new. We've installed three of them now in Diamond Valley this year, and we'll follow that over the next three years to find out uh, how those systems work with uh, soil moisture sensors as well as ET scheduling irrigation, being as efficient as we can, we're going to compare that with normal irrigation. So we're, we're, we're developing data on that for Nevada. And then schedule irrigation using ET data and soil moisture sensors. That's what everybody can do. 
Here's kind of some of the pictures that go into these high pressure, uh, lower efficiency. Obviously, you've got this stuff in the air. We get a little bit windy around uh, western Nevada every afternoon. I, I've stood on the downwind side of those things. <laughs> I mean, on the upwind side, you don't even get wet. You're 20 feet wet, you know, the water's blowing. So most of them have gone to this, where we drop it down lower. But these LEPA systems are becoming more and more uh, common. They dro drop them right down, either right on the canopy or right below the canopy even. And you basically are flooding it is what you're doing. Okay, subsurface drip. Like I said, uh, we, this, the, when we did that work, we did it years ago, we did it in Lovelock. And we pumped out of a ditch. Worked really well. Uh, it's one of the most efficient systems you got because you don't wet the soil surface, right? The only water you're putting on is below the soil surface. So if you, you eliminate surface evaporation, that helps tremendously around here. In, in our middle of our summertime, wind's blowing hot, evaporation levels are high. The other thing that's nice about it is you can irrigate at all times, all, right through a cutting, because you're not, you're not wet in the soil surface. And so when you see things like uh, out at Stillwater where you're two and a half, three weeks off the field trying to dry it up, that's going to cause uh, loss of yields. And so irrigation is possible all the time. Obviously not going to be affected by wind. And you can match maximum crop ET. Now what are some of the disadvantages? Well, because we don't push it to the surface, you need a sprinkler system or some other system to germinate it and get your crop up. That's what you've got to have. There's going to be higher maintenance costs, obviously, because you're looking at, you've got filters, you've got flow meters on there, you're going to be injecting chemicals, uh, so there's, there is higher maintenance. But in my mind, the biggest problem with these things are gophers. As long as we were running that stuff, we had no problem with gophers. But when we shut it off, we had big problem with gophers. And I mean, it wasn't just eating a hole in it. So they'd eat a hole, and then they'd go down a little bit, and then they'd eat another hole, and they'd go down a little bit and eat another hole. I'd come in the spring, and I'd fire it up. I got a volcano. So here's April. I'm on my hands and knees, digging down 18 inches in the mud, cussing gophers like crazy. Cut my pipe. I fix it. Bury everything up. Turn it back on. And four feet away, I get another one. And it went on like that and on. And so you have to be willing to control gophers. If you're not, don't even think about it, because it, it, it's an absolute nightmare. Uh, the other thing is you can get into emitter clogging through root intrusion. The roots actually grow into the emitters, or these chemical buildups, your bicarbonates, carbonates, things like that. And uh, it's fairly easy to take care of. We use bleach, uh, and we used acid, injected acid into the water, and keep those things flowing. And, and the way you t determine it, you look at your uh, flow meters. If your flow meters are going like it's supposed to, no problem, you'll start to see loss of flow. When you see loss of flow, you know you're getting a problem. Obviously, you've got to be filtered, and you've got to monitor soil moisture. Because you can run these 24-7, you can waste just as much water with these as you do with anything else. You've got to monitor your soil moisture, and you can't see the soil, right? It looks all the same. All right, let's talk about some other crops. I'm going to uh, restrict my discussion to uh, forage crops, because 90% of our land is used to grow forages, but there are other things obviously you can grow. In, in Urington, for example, they're growing vegetables and stuff like that under subsurface drip. But we'll talk about these forages, because that's what the vast majority of people would deal with. You got winter cereal grains, and that's rye, triticalia, and wheat. The problem with, uh, we call them winter grains, they're actually planted in September. They're planted early in the fall. You irrigate them up, get them up big enough uh, that they go into the winter, they're, they're uh, fairly well established. Obviously, in years like this year and last year, can't do that. We got no fall irrigation, right? Uh, the advantage of these things, if you do have it, though, is you get a great start for the coming year. Plus, you can get some grazing on this stuff. If you got some cattle, you get grazing on it in the fall. So th th that's the advantage. But it won't work uh, for the most part uh, under the situations that we're in today. Now, we talk about these spring seeded grains. Got the same three plus barley and oats. We don't usually use barley and oats in the wintertime because around here it can get cold enough they can winter kill. And so now let's uh, talk about some warm season grasses. I've been doing work the last two years with sedan grass and Ford sorghums and sedan crosses. These things are extremely efficient in water use. Uh, I've, just, I've got about half my data back from the, the labs that I sent this stuff into. And uh, on, the, on the place at Reno, between precip and, and what I applied, I applied about a foot of water. And my top yields for silage were 15 tons with a foot of water. 
In here, we put about a foot and a half of water on. We cut it off, obviously, earlier. It's a sandy soil versus a silt loam over there, a completely different situation. Foot and a half, uh, our best stuff was about, would you open that door? It's about eight tons. But you'll still see uh, these things from warm season grasses are extremely water use efficient, a lot of pounds per unit of water. So we're going to see more and more of these come around. And uh, I gave a little talk, uh, preliminary work, uh, last week on, on some of the work that I've done. But this spring, I'll have this data, and I'll, I'll be able to talk about it a lot more in depth this spring. Obviously, teff, we know about teff around here. Another warm season grass uses a little more water than these do as, as far as uh, water use efficiency. They're maybe not quite as good, but maybe a little more acceptance on hay you know, to, to horse people and stuff like that, a nice little crop. And one we don't grow a lot of, but is, really has some potential, are these millets. These things are, again, they're similar to these, and that these are all, of course, frost sensitive. You don't put them in until after frost is over. But they give you some good tonnage of, of fairly decent material. And so there's something to consider. So if we look at some of the advantages and some of the problems, alfalfa is going to be somewhere around 48 inches to 50 inches of uh, consumptive use. Rye, it's the toughest one, 18 inches, and you're going to do fairly well with it. Problem with rye is, is that it matures so darn fast, it gets rank, and, and you use it as brooms or something. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty tough to use as forage. But if you want to, you want the, if some people ask me, I want to know what's the toughest thing I can put out there, rye's the one for you. Triticale is a cross between wheat, wheat, and, wheat and rye, and uh, a little, it's, it's a, a little less efficient, but it, uh, it's, uh, it's a little bit better in quality. And we're seeing a, a big use of, of triticale. That's, that's getting more and more uh, popular all the time. Wheat, probably our most popular uh, spring uh, grain we use. Uh, good quality, everything else. The only thing you really got to work, worry about a little bit on that is the potential for bloat if you're grazing it early. That real hot green grass, you get into grass tetany or bloat problems. And you actually you can get that in any of these if you get on it too early. Barley and oats, uh, a little, use a little more water, but they, uh, the thing you got to, especially oats, you got to be careful about nitrate toxicity. You come out of an alfalfa field, you want to get your yields up, you put 75 to 100 units of N on, on oats, you better check it before you feed it, because I've seen it tip them over. Uh, and, and you blend it is how you get rid of that, but it, it's fairly easy to check. But it's, it's something that you've got to worry a little bit about. These Sudan grasses and the forage sorghums, again, real efficient, but you can get into some problem with prussic acid. Uh, prussic acid basically converts to cyanide, and we all know what cyanide does. Uh, it, and uh, it, when you look at it for grazing, the literature will tell you 12 inches. The CYA, I tell people 18 inches. And if you get it too low early in the year, you've got some real potential for problems with that. The other time you can get into problems with it is if we sh run short of water and you drought stress it, you'll see that prussic acid level go up, or if it freezes in the fall. Now the good thing is once it goes down, either freezes or dries up, it's a gas, so it dissipates. Give it a week, two weeks, you're fine. You don't have to worry about it. We're around here probably where it's most problematic is when it freezes and you look at it and you think it's dead. You haven't went out and looked at the base and it's still green and turning cattle out. You can cause problems without a doubt. Teff, the biggest problem with teff is it just lodges. If you don't cut it early, if you let those seed heads get too big, it's going to be all of it's laying on the ground and it's just a mess to cut and handle. Millets, uh, really, uh, again, very efficient. Uh, can be pretty good quality feed. The only thing you've got to be a little careful about are the foxtail types. They'll cause, they're a diuretic and can cause problems with horses. But the other ones, uh, your pearl, Japanese, you shouldn't have much problem with that at all. And so those are all, these are potential, and like I said, we can talk about these uh, as, time, as uh, time goes along. Because we may be uh, seeing more of it. Now let's talk about alfalfa and drought. Good news is that alfalfa is an extremely drought tolerant plant. I mean, it's deep rooted, it's tough, it, it's well suited for our part of the world, and that's why we see so much of it around. It, it, it really is. Uh, the good thing is, is it'll enter dormancy, it won't die on you. Shut the water off on it, it'll go dormant, but it'll come back. Assuming you're going to put water back on it, we don't have one of these 100 year mega droughts and see Jeffrey Pines growing in the Walker River. And uh, we've, we see that it can stand a fairly long period of time without much loss of stand. But proper management's the key to that. And that's what I'm going to finish up with tonight, talking about this. First thing we got to know is ET. 
What is ET? Evapotranspiration is what that stands for. And it's a combination of water loss through evaporation from the soil surface. And that's especially uh, important early in the season before you got any plant cover, right? Your first irrigation. Now, even though it's cool, you're still your, your evaporation part of this is going to be fairly high. As the plants mature and get larger, the transpiration portion of that takes over. And transpiration is the movement of water from, plant, from the soil up through the plant roots and out through the plant leaves. It brings nutrients up, it's, it has to be used for photosynthesis, and it's used for cooling the plant. So as the plant matures, the, the transpiration part of this becomes way dominant. But it's hard to measure the difference, so we lump it together into ET, to be honest with you. And so what we normally look at is ET. And, and why is ET important? This is data from all over the western US. And you can see uh, across the bottom axis, this is seasonal evapotranspiration getting larger as we go across. This is yield in tons per acre. And you can see there's almost straight line relationships to ET and production with alfalfa. As ET goes up, production goes up. And so uh, obviously we get up here at some point, it's going to level off and go, and go this way. But typically in the West, we don't have enough water to reach that point. So generally speaking, as ET goes up, production goes up. In Nevada, if we look at just generally speaking, it's about six inches of ET per ton of alfalfa. South, it's going to be less, uh, excuse me, much more. It's hotter, and so uh, you'll, you'll be a little less efficient. Up north, it'll be a bit, little bit lower. But generally speaking, about six tons, six inches per ton of alfalfa. So we know there's a strong positive relationship between ET and crop production. Anything that reduces ET reduces plant yields. In Nevada, low soil moisture is the most common thing that limits ET, the most common thing. And the irrigation goal should be to meet 100% of ET while considering your soil, mortgage, sto soil, soil storage capacity, and that's, that's critical. You'll see, uh, if you look at ET data, it climbs and climbs and climbs, and then we cut, right? Yeah. And it drops dramatically because we've lost the plant cover, but the, the evaporation part of that goes up because you've got bare soil, right? It, absolutely the case. And so what, if you look at it, actually ET, when they measure it, it goes up, it cuts, it drops, it goes up, and it, and it does like that through the season is what it does. And so uh, and you use and you have to... One of the things you look at is what they call crop coefficients to look at ET by plant growth. Because early in the year, it's going to be much lower than it is later in, in a plant growth, uh, part of the plant growth uh, life cycle. The question is, what is available to the plant? And that's going to vary tremendously by soil texture. And so that's why you can get by in, in Lovelock with one irrigation and, and not have it look that bad because they've got tight soils. And, and, and I'm going to talk about that in just a second, uh, about the, the relationship, because it's critical to understand an ir irrigation. Now, how are we going to estimate ET? How do you get that information? Well, th I've used these before, and they're actually pretty good. It's called an atmometer. And basically what it is is a hollow tube that you fill with distilled water. It's got a little tiny... Uh, or a small disc, ceramic disc on top with a, with a cover on it, and it mimics what's going on in your field. So you fill it up here, come back in a week later and read it here, and the difference between the two was what your ET was for that time period. And so you look at that and you say, okay, uh, over a 10-day period, we uh, lost three inches. You know, I'm going to have to replace that three inches because that's what was the plant and the, and the soil lost through evaporation. What some people do with sprinklers, this is a class A evap pan, same way you can put a gauge in it, but some people will mark it or have the gauge in and mark it and then time their pivot or their wheel move so that it'll fill that back up to the where it was when they left there. So if it's, again, a 10-day period and it went down three and a half inches, you ought to set it so when that pivot goes over the top, your precipitation rate is adequate to refill that. That's, I mean, that's a pretty simple way, but it, it can work. And we see more and more of these, these remote weather stations, where they, ET is a calculated value. They don't measure it for the most part. They've got data where they did measure it, 
and they've been able to use uh, equations to come up with that. We have one in Fallon, this is a U.S. Bureau of Rec, and one in Eureka. This is the Agrimet station. And, and the reason these are nice is because they call me up every year and I go out and I look at the fields around here and I say, all right, and this year it was mid-February, we need to start gathering ET data because the plants were growing, right? I mean, they were, they were greened up, usually two weeks later, I usually around the first of March or something. This year was early. So when I tell them that, then they start recording ET. And so you can look at that for alfalfa or grapes or pasture or all these different crops and look at what your ET was for that week or for that day or, or whatever time period you want to you measure. Now, these are in, in places like Arizona and California and all those places, they got a million of these things for ag. We don't, we're not that lucky. But DRI does have a whole series of stations around Nevada that you can look up and look at the calculation. It's a, it's a reference ET, what they call a reference ET. It's not the same. It's not going to be the same as for alfalfa or grapes or these different crops because you haven't used a crop coefficient to adjust it. But if you don't have anything else, it's not a bad place to start because between alfalfa and the reference ET isn't that far off. You're going to be, it's probably uh, crop coefficient be 0.93 or something like that. So it's going to be relatively close. All right, let's talk about alfalfa. It breaks dormancy when the air temperature gets much more than about 45 degrees for very long, 50 degrees. And around here, one of the other things I've seen in Nevada, we've gone to much less dormant varieties. We want that extra yield, right? So we've gone to these fives, fours and fives, where it used to be twos and threes. So what that means is that means as soon as it starts to warm up, that plant starts jumping. That's, that's what it is. That's the difference between a fall dormancy four and a, and a 10 or an eight, and so, and a one. A one might not start growing at all. It has to be warm enough for a long enough time before it starts. So we're seeing these newer varieties are pushing earlier. Root growth is going to be a couple weeks before that. So it's going to be pretty darn early. Cool season grass, these pastures are going to break dormancy a couple weeks before that. They're actually cooler. They like cooler weather even better than alfalfa does. So the point is, is that you've got to have adequate soil moisture available to that plant when it starts growing. If you don't, you're losing production because what I just say, ET and production are tied very closely together. Now let's look at as far as moisture extraction. What this chart shows you is that about the upper three feet is going to, you're going to is where alfalfa is going to take 90% of its water. So that's important when we're talking about soil, figuring how much water you have in the soil. We call this the rooting zone. And so about a three-foot rooting zone is what I normally use for calculation when I'm trying to figure out how much water is in the soil. All right, let's, let's talk about water content of, of various soils. Coarse sands. It's only going to hold, no matter how much water you put on it. I see this in people with turf grass, their lawns. I've got a water to say, I'm, I'm pouring the water to it. If you've got a coarse sand, put all the water you want on it, it's only going to hold once gravity takes over a half an inch per foot, approximately. So if you put on three inches, two and a half inches is going to the bottom. Not going to be any use. Now if we get down here into sandy loam, this is what I really like to grow stuff in, these sandy loam soils. They're going to hold about an inch and a half per foot of, of soil. About an inch and a half of water. That's what's going to be available total, right? Field capacity. Now if we look at five, three feet, I want to take that three feet because that's where my alfalfa roots are is in that upper three feet. I'm going to have four and a half inches of water in that soil available to that plant. But I'm going to start irrigating once it gets to 50%. So I only really have 2.25 or two and a quarter inches of water available to that plant, right? That's all I'm going to have because after 24 hours, it's down below, it's gone. Now getting into the soil, what we have is we have a situation, you, you flood your field, right? It's completely saturated. Well, after 24 hours, where gravitational pull is acted on that water for 24 hours, at that point, that's called field capacity. And that's a measurement of inches per foot of water. And it changes dramatically from sands to clays. Now, from an irrigator standpoint, once you get to 50% of that field's capacity, that water holding capacity, that soil, you want to think about putting water back on. 
Because what happens, once it gets down to 50 or 55, 50 percent, it gets below that, energy that was used to grow plants is now used to pull water out of the soil. Well, once it uses energy to pull water out of the soil, what happens? Where does it come from? It comes from production is where it comes from. And so as it gets lower and lower and lower, eventually we get into what's called a permanent wilting point. Can't pull the water. Absolutely impossible. The plant does exactly what it says. It wilts. And then it gets drier and the plant dies. And so as an irrigator, you're going to want to keep that somewhere 50, 55 percent to 100 percent of field capacity, ideally. That way that plant has adequate water, but there's enough oxygen in the soil that you're not drowning the darn thing out. Because alfalfa does not like wet feet. Now, let's look at evapotranspiration in Fallon the last three years. I haven't pulled the data for this year. It's running around four and a half, five inches, something like that, from when it starts growing till April 15th. And I cut that off at April 15th because that's typically when we get our water. Right? People start thinking about irrigating about April 15th. So from, say, in, in 2013 uh, or 14, we started in February 22nd through April, you're going to use four and a half, five inches of water. That's what that plant is going to use. Now, if we don't get any water from the air or that soil isn't completely full from the wintertime, uh-oh, we only got two and a quarter inches available in the soil but the plant needs four and a half inches or five inches. So what's that tell you? You're going to hurt production is what it tells you. And this is important for another reason, not just production now, but we want to talk about, uh, I'm going to talk about water use efficiency, because that's really critical in a time of drought. So we've got to have adequate soil moisture to allow maximum ET. I showed you before, precipitation typically isn't adequate to do that. So we've got to replace it uh, as it's removed due to plant growth, and irrigation is the only way we're going to do it. This is why I'm pushing to talk about getting some water available earlier for you guys. Because looking at the data, we're going to be short. Now, we're also going to put some watermark sensors in this year. We're going to track this and get some hard data that says, let's see where we're at. And, so, uh, and uh, Seth is going to talk about these soil sensors that we put in that look at water, measure, measure water content soil water content and give us an idea. All right, water use efficiency. Either tons or pounds of alfalfa per acre per inches of water applied. This is some work that was done clear back when I started an extension. Uh, and we looked at water use efficiency at various ETs. And what we did, we started applying water early. When it got to 75%, we shut it off. Got to 50%, we shut it off. Well, you look here at 75%, we were getting about 360, something like that, 360 pounds of alfalfa per inch of water applied. But look when we were clear over here at 125, we were clear down to around 250 pounds. And the reason is, is during the hot part of the summer, your water use efficiency drops dramatically. So I look at this. This is data out of California. Those guys have done a lot more work than we have. And you'll see we have... To uh, the dash line, this is ET. <coughs> Obviously, as it gets hotter, your ET goes up, right, over the season. Early on, you don't have much evaporation, not much plant growth, but as time goes along, it goes up. Peaks in June and July, August. Here, this is here, is your water use efficiency curve. It, over here in the springtime, you're as high as 320 pounds per inch. Came pretty close to what we were looking at on the stuff we did in Nevada. But here in the middle of the summertime, you're down to 200 pounds per inch of water. Now you as a producer with limited water, where are you going to want to put it on? Right here, right? That's where you're going to want to put it on. If you wait to clear out here, you're hurting yourself. Your efficiency drops dramatically. Now if we got enough to get some back in the fall, it starts to go back up again. But really for us in drought, here's where the critical time is. And that's an R squared or a, a correlation of 90%. So what are we going to do here? Are we going to fully irrigate all the fields, or a portion of the fields? Or are we going to spread it all over the fields, limited water, spread it out, give it less water, right? Because we don't have enough, obviously. Or are we going to irrigate all fields full, fully early and eliminate irrigation later? Those, that's, that's kind of our options, right? That's what, what's what we have. We got, we got more options than that. 
Well, yeah, well, let's look at, look at this now. This is, uh, again, coming out of Intermountain region, California, Idaho, all the rest of us. If we look at three cut systems, about 75% of your yields occur in the first two cuts. It's all front loaded. It's not quite that much with a four cut system. You're around 60%. But the fact of the matter is, your first two cuts, for, as far as tonnage, are your important ones, right? Now, if we look at irrigation response in regards to percent of ET, you can see over here, if we only had, we only have replaced 50% of ET, our yields were only 62% of normal. But look, cut one and cut two. Cut three really didn't do much for you. And we see this, at 75% of ET, we were still 93%, but still, your first two cuts were most important. Northern California, this is the Tule Lake region, uh, three cut system. This has had a high water table. And you see the same thing. Obviously, uh, they had no irrigation after first cutting. They had 86% of normal yield, front end loaded, just like uh, the rest. This is no irrigation after the second cutting. But they were clear up at 93% yield. Now, obviously, it's worse where you don't have any water table close to the surface that's contributing to that. But still, no irrigation after the first. They were 55% in the yield. And their first two cuts is where it was at. So what happens under a deficit irrigation like that? That's what we call deficit irrigation. We're going we're to cut it off before the season's over with. This is some work out of Colorado looking at uh, actually uh, stems, not crowns, per meter square. Uh, with full irrigation, no irrigation after second. There was irrigation up through the first and then again at the fourth and no irrigation after the first. At the end of the year, there was no difference in stem counts, statistically. California, on the work that they did over that, no visual difference, no difference in the number of stems per acre, and no detectable yield differences. So we know for at least one year, you can, you can short these plants, you don't hurt it. And actually, it's, it's more like two. I don't know after it goes after that, but, but we can do that without hurting these plants. These are, this is established, now I'm talking about established alfalfa. So let's look at this. Drought irrigation strategies. Got 100 acres of hay. Our normal allocation, we wish, 50 inches for easy figuring. I'm an Aggie after all. I got to have something easy to figure. Uh, drought hits, we get 50% of normal, so we're only going to get 25 inches is all we're going to get this year. Alfalfa price, 200 bucks a ton. So do we irrigate all 100 acres at 50%? Do we irrigate 50 acres at 100%? Or do we irrigate all 100 acres for two cuts and then don't irrigate for cuts three and four? Remember, it's a, almost a straight line uh, relationship between yield and ET. So at 50 inches, we're going to get about eight tons. At 25 inches, we're going to get about four tons, a little more than four tons is what we're going to get because we shut it off. Scenario two, we, we're going to put all our water on 50 acres. So we're going to get our eight tons, do the math, 405 tons, $200 a ton, a little less gross income, 81,000 versus 84, but our variable costs are lower because we're only spreading it over 50 acres. We're only having to cut 50 acres. We only have to fertilize 50 acres, spray 50 acres. So our input costs are lower. So that doesn't look too bad. Remember, it's a, almost a straight line. Uh, relationship between yield and ET. So at 50 inches, we're going to get about 8 tons. At 25 inches, we're going to get about 4 tons, a little more than 4 tons is what we're going to get because we shut it off. What about this? Scenario number three, irrigate 100 acres with full irrigation on the first two cuts and then shut it off. You're going to use about 60% of normal. You get about 4.86 tons. 100 acres, do your math, $97,200 gross income with all your costs, variable costs on 100 acres. So typically, and this is, I use this as an illustration, but this is what literature will show you uh, throughout the West. You're better off, Roger, to put your water on early, irrigate all the way just like normal, use an ET, you know, do not short the plant, and when you run out, shut it off. I tell, tell my cows they got to quit eating now. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're going to get... 486 tons, but you're, you're a grazing guy, so you're a, little, you're a little bit different. 
So, bottom line, when, when you have limited water, deficit irrigation is your production related to exactly to how much you can put on. Water use efficiency is highest spring and fall. Fully irrigating all your fields, all your acres, assuming they're decent producing you know, acres, is better than spreading a little water all across it. And uh, summer deficit irrigation has little impact on, on your stands, at least for the first two years. And, and it, it's, uh, again, the literature is pretty, really pretty solid on this. It, it's not just me. So harvest management, what about that? Well, drought, the, the, no matter what, you're still stressing these plants, right? Because they're shorting them on water. So unirrigated cuttings. One of the <coughs> things we recommend is harvest them later. Give that plant a chance to grow up and, and finish physiologically mature a little bit. 10% bloom is what we used to use. When I started in extension and, and consulting 35 years ago, everybody did 10% bloom. That's what everybody talked about. Hell, today with, with the dairy stuff, if you've got a purple flower, people have a heart attack. Uh, I mean, and, and the problem with that is, yeah, you get higher income, right? But the problem is it hurts that plant. Don't think it doesn't. When you're cutting that plant, before it has a chance to physiologically mature, you're taking carbohydrate storage, you're taking the thing that it does, and you're damaging the plant. And I, and I hear a lot, all these older stands, uh, these older varieties lasted way longer. Mm, I don't know about that. We didn't cut them as often as we do. They cut them a lot later. And so let it go a little later. And typically on, when prices like this are high for alfalfa, quantity will overtake quality. It'll make you more money. Yield will be better than quality. Now, if you get into a situation where lots of hay, that's not true. Quality is where it's at. But if you're trying to sell hay, on, when hay prices are high, you want to go for quantity anyway. And you want to get about a six inch, allow, do it early enough that you get about six inches before we get these hard freezes. Be, and that six inches is based on that plant's ability. Now, once it gets to six inches, you've had enough time for that plant to photosynthesize to put those carbohydrates back into the roots and make that plant healthy going into the winter. Four inch minimum, six inches is better. And I've seen this when they don't do this, where they're grazing it late in the year, grazing it and grazing it and grazing it. And it goes in, we have a hard winter, open winter. This was an Elko. So I saw production declines of 75% on two year old stands. Beautiful stands. And generally, if you got under half a ton per acre from a machine standpoint, it's not worth harvesting. Economically, it doesn't make any sense. You can come in and bring some cows in if you want, as long as you leave. You can come in when it's, it's dormant and leave some, leave some stubble. Don't, don't graze to the ground. But uh, generally, when you're to that point, I would, even though you, uh, if it's under half a ton, think of plant health versus just money in your pocket for that year because you're already stressing that plant. How about fertilization management? You know, if your yields are off, can I afford to fertilize? can't afford not to. If you have fertility level problems, uh, when that plant is stressed, the fertilizer is more important then than it is when you've got normal resources, water and everything else. And so you want to maintain your soil fertility levels on these alfalfa fields during these drought conditions. You don't want to short them. Uh, obviously avoid over fertilization. That's not usually too big a problem around here. All right, pest management strategies. You got to get out there early and scout those fields. This year we had aphid problems, terrible. Aphid problems and a lot of our pests, if you can get them early, that's the secret to getting them. If you let them get too far advanced, you're gonna have problems. And aphids and some of our other animals or some of these insects, actually f the way, what they do, they get on the plant and they drill their little nose in their aphids and they suck the plant juices out. Well, you think that doesn't stress the plant? It stresses the heck out of them. So you gotta do pest, adequate pest control for insects and weeds. I mean, the reason weeds are a, pro a problem is because they're more efficient at extracting water and nutrients and things like that from the soil than what we plant. So when we're in a situation like we are in now, weed control is even more important than it is under good times. Because in the good times, we can make up for some of that slop. We give them a little extra water, we give it a little extra fertilizer, things are good. So it's a more important now than it even is later. So I'm gonna finish up. Irrigate all acreages fully, early and until the water's exhausted. That's what you want to do. Implement harvest fertilization of pest control techniques that reduce the stress on those plants. Your number one cost of producing alfalfa is establishment. So if you can keep that thing in a year or two later, 
and during these drought periods through good management, it's money in your pocket. And they can survive and produce a relatively long time under less than ideal conditions. That's the good, the good part of that. And so with that, I think I'm done. I mean, two, there's two things, I mean, from a practical standpoint. One is you have to irrigate, the way we're set up now, you have to irrigate to the majority. You have no choice. So if the majority of your fields are sandy, you're going to have to irrigate more often, right? The second problem we have around here is getting your water delivered on time. I, I, come, I come out of sprinkler country, and I used to look over in this part of the country, and I'd say, man, those guys in Fallon got it made. They're, they're flooding. They can get water whenever they want it. And I come over here, holy moly, I'm standing over here saying, man, those sprinkler guys got it made. They can get water whenever they want, you know. <laughs> and really, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a problem. It really is a problem because I will guarantee you on sandy soils, looking at ET and soil holding, water holding capacity, when you're going 10 days to two weeks between irrigations, you're hurting that plant. I will guarantee you you are hurting production. Boy, I sure don't. Irrigation systems should be designed from the soil up. Right. I don't care whether you're border or if you're sprinklers. You ought to go out and know what that soil you're dealing with because infiltration rate, this is what kills them on sprinklers, Roger. They go out and they, they, they run a sprinkler around and to try to get enough water on to meet ET, let's say it's three tenths an inch a day, in five days we need an inch and a half, he's putting an inch. He's a half an inch out every week, right? We shut it off for 10 days because we're going to harvest. Where's he at? He's dead is where he's at. So. The, but the problem is, is that your, your sprinkler is putting out water faster than the soil can take it. And so typically what you see is they're, get, they're having to gravel all their, wheel line, all their wheel tracks, and they can't get the water on efficiently. And so what you needed, and, and what they do with some of these LEPA systems, is you match the water output to the soil infiltration rate better is what you, is what you do. And then you can speed up. I mean, uh, the good thing about a pivot, right? I can make it go faster or slower. Then I can make it wipe. I can do whatever I want with it. And so that's, that's the ideal situation. Uh, around here, what you've got to look at is you've got to look at your head, border width and border length, based on soils. Because sands, obviously, are going to be completely different than a tight soil, right? Going to be completely different. And so whenever a sprinkler, any irrigation system is designed, it should be designed from the soil up. Typically, that's not the case. But that's the only way that I know that you match your capabilities to deliver water to what you have on the ground. The truth of the matter is, is what you need is you need a good irrigation engineer. See, we don't have one. I'm working with those guys out of Idaho. I, I contracted with the irrigation engineers out of Idaho to work on this Diamond Valley project because we don't have one. And so, because, you know, I mean, really, to do a well-designed irrigation system is pretty complex, done right. And, and so it's one of those things that uh, usually what happens is, done right, you'll work with somebody like myself and that knows soils, and you work with an irrigation engineer, and you come up with a system that works pretty well. Now, NRCS has, a, has uh, believe it or not, has a uh, software package that should be able to do this. You ought to be able to input your soils data, your, your head. Yeah, they do. They, they have one. You, can, you plug in these figures. He's been out there on the place, and we've discussed this. Sure. Yeah. I wonder if have your input. Yeah, I, I, I'd be more than happy to help you, Roger. I mean, because it really, I, I think what we're going to see as water gets shorter, we're going to see shorter runs and narrower borders. That's what we're going to have to see. If not, we're, we're just not, it's not going to